request has been to come to Finhorn, and so I really feel like I've accomplished something by just being here. I'm greatly thankful and honored um, that you've come out to hear me tonight. So I'm going to take you through a series of mycological solutions. This is going to be really informationally intense, I promise you that, but if you will get some very useful, practical information that you can literally put into practice you know, as soon as tomorrow, or even tonight. Um, many of you noticed that the mushrooms are greeting us with uh, just a heroic performance right now. We've been out collecting mushrooms most every day for the past three days, and there's a surge of mushrooms coming up in the ecosystem that's far earlier than, than I expected, and most of you, I think, as well. But it's a testimonial that the mushrooms are here to greet us, and, you know, nature speak, speaks will we listen. And I want to, you know, bring messages from the fungal kingdom, and I'm just one person in a long lineage of experts, going back thousands and thousands of years. I also want to honor Ann Miller, who's here tonight, who has a local mushroom business, and I strongly encourage you to support her, because it's difficult to get the message out, because we encounter something called mycophobia, the irrational fear of mushrooms. And in the UK, you know, in Scotland, Ireland, and in England, there is a more of a mycophobic uh, attitude uh, than in France, for instance, or Russia, where they have a long history of, of uh, finding and collecting mushrooms. So, um, you know, here we are today, you know, and the earth is in crisis. I don't think, you know, I have to convince anybody about that. And I speak to you as one voice. I am Paul Stamets. But I'm a plurality of microorganisms that are unified together and in symbiosis speaking with one voice to your communities of microorganisms. And the more that we understand symbiosis, the more we understand how nature has evolved to get us to the stage that we are at today. The fungi are critically important with respect to the evolution of life on this planet. And there have been so many discoveries in the past three, four, five years about how important fungi have been in terms of evolution that I kind of want to bring you up this path, and it's the path that I have followed as well. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering what's the deal with this hat. So let me tell you, this hat is made from a mushroom that grows on birch trees here. It's called Amadou, that's the French name. It's a fire starter mushroom. The Latin name is Fomis fomentarius. And Alan, our wizard of the woods, uh, was kind enough to give me a little pamphlet, and he's an expert on this mushroom as well. And it's a fire starter mushroom. And it's a wood conch, a little hoof-shaped mushroom that grows on birch trees. And this mushroom enabled the migration of humans out of Africa. There's no doubt, several hundred thousand years ago, we were, came out of Africa. We all are Africans uh, at heart. And we migrated north and we discovered something new called winter. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> and so this mushroom allowed for the portability of fire. You can hollow this mushroom out, put embers of the fire inside of it, and carry fire for days. And the fire keeper of tribe of clans is what we know ceremonially, they have an important role. But from a practical point of view, you know, not too many thousands of years ago, they were absolutely critical for human survival. As we migrated into Europe, we discovered winter, we went to caves, and if you could not keep fire alive, your clan or your tribe would perish. So the fire keeper was absolutely critical to human survival. So this mushroom, when you boil it in water, it uh, it starts to delaminate, and you add lye, or you add ashes from a fire, and then you can separate this mushroom into fiber. And some of you may have heard of it, uh, known as German felt. And the, the fiber that the mushroom would be pulled apart, that, that's actually mycelium. You always hear a lot about mycelium. And that fabric then is, is mashed and felted, and then it's heated, and then it's like hair. It curls a little bit when it shrinks under heat, and it gives us this nice, nice texture. So some ladies in Transylvania still are making these hats now over thousands of years. And this is yet another example that the knowledge ancestrally passed down from generation by generation just hangs on a very thin thread of individuals who have this knowledge who can pass it down. So, um, this mushroom was essential to human survival and I'm going to present to you a cast of fungal friends and characters that I think are equally as important. So, I want all of you to hold on to your hat <laughs> as much as you can and let's go on a magical mushroom mystery tour. I think the way in the future is the way to be able to follow the path of mycelium. And here is our beautiful plant, coalescing out of stardust 14, 4.5 billion years ago. And the, the entire planet 
uh, land masses are covered with, with the mycelial networks. I want to pay first respect to my elders, uh, Dr. Uh, Alexander Smith, uh, who was the foremost mycologist in North America, uh, Dr. Daniel Stuntz, uh, and Dr. Michael Bu. These are the three of my mentors, these two gentlemen that now passed on to the other side. And they were extremely kind to me when I was 17, 18 years of age, I first met them. Uh, and they took me under their wing, and I'm thankful that I was, I was uh, mentored by some of the greatest uh, scientists in the field of mycology who's ever walked this planet. Um, so this is all the more remarkable because uh, when I was 19, 20 years of age, this is what I looked like. <laughs> you can draw your own conclusions. So the mushroom mycelium is triggered into mushroom formation through a, th a series of environmental and habitat triggers. Once nutrition has been gathered, then typically a drop in temperature that coincides with, a, with the introduction of rain or water, uh, the mycelium wicks up to the surface and exhales carbon dioxide, inhales oxygen, just like we do. And then um, these mushrooms, most mushrooms are phototrophic, photosensitive. They have no chlorophyll, but they respond to and grow towards light. So those four environmental stimuli uh, is, is what triggers mushroom flushes to occur. And so this is a baby primordium, as we call it, growing out of a sea of mycelium. And then very, very rapidly it expands into, into a mushroom. Now this is a, a almond portobello, and it's called Agaricus brasiliensis, Agaricus blasii. Um, it's a potent medicinal mushroom, uh, but it has a classic stem, gills, and the veil predicts the gills and it falls. And we have a beautiful Amanita muscaria down here, and this is the red top mushroom with the little dots, and I was very happy we picked this yesterday. And mushrooms grow against gravity. It's called negative geotropism. And I was hoping this would happen, and it did. I was really happy uh, because I told Daniel and, and Alice that the, the, when you pick these little amanitas when they're young, you lay them on the side, they've been picked out off the ground, lay them on the side on a dish, and then overnight they'll continue to grow. Even though they detach from the ground, they'll restructure. The, the, the mushroom, and so it will develop into full maturity and it grows against gravity. So it's a fun thing for you to play with your, your kids and your friends. You can never be poisonous from the most deadly poisonous to mushroom by touching it. It's not true. So, you know, don't have a fear of touching mushrooms. And I always told my children, all mushrooms should be cooked. Only daddy and mama cook mushrooms. And if you want to touch mushrooms, go ahead. And so my kids would sometimes bring me deadly poisonous mushrooms. I get really excited. That's great! That's the most deadly poisonous mushroom in North America! Yahoo! And the kids go, ooh! Uh, <laughs> but they always know that you always cook mushrooms, and so they never had the inclination of putting mushrooms in their mouths because you shouldn't eat mushrooms wrong. So, but mushrooms have many different forms. And this is where Dusty and I go to church on Sunday. My wife Dusty is not here today in, 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 in body, but she's here in, in spirit. She's a huge part of my life, a huge part of, of our success. So, I know I want to definitely let everyone know that she's, uh, you know, there's two legs in, in, this, uh, in this entity here, and, and without her I could not have done anything that I've, I've been able to accomplish. But Dustin and I spent a lot of time in the Old Growth Forest of Washington State where we live, and um, the, and the Olympic Peninsula was like a, a country of Old Growth Forest. And I like this photograph a lot because there's a thin trail of going through the Old Growth Forest, and I think our, our steps across the landscapes of nature have to be taken very, very carefully. So, this is the front cover of my book, and I had a friend of mine, Ann Gunter, design this cover. Because I wanted to show the cross-section of nature. All plants are part fungi. Science, April 15, 2005, that was the title of the article. And plant biologists, when they were taking tissue cultures of plants, you know, any plants, they would keep on finding these fungal growths, this mycelium growing, they thought it was the contaminants for a very long time. And now we do know for, from DNA sequencing that all plants are embedded with fungi. Now we know about the saprophytic mushrooms that grow on logs. You've all seen those, turkey tails and oyster mushrooms and, and the wood conchs. And there are mushrooms that can kill trees, like armillary and root rot mushrooms can kill trees. And then the mushroom can grow saprophytically. So you have parasitic mushrooms, you have saprophytic mushrooms. You have mycorrhizal mushroom, mushroom species that grow and extend the root zones. And we'll be talking about those. Expanding the root zones hundreds of times. And then you have a group called the endophytes, and the endophytic fungi are particularly interesting, and it's gotten scientists extraordinarily excited. There are going to be up to 200 mushroom associates around the Douglas fir tree in its lifetime. So there are guilds of these mushrooms growing around the roots of the trees. 
inside the tree itself and on the leaves, there could be hundreds upon hundreds of endophytic fungi. Now, a good story about endophytic fungi came out about eight years ago when researchers walking at Yellowstone Hot Springs around Old Faithful. Has anybody here been to Yellowstone Hot Springs? Walking around Old Faithful is amazing. You should please go there before it blows up. <laughs> it's a giant volcano. Um, but around Yellowstone, uh, in the Yellowstone Hot Springs, around Old Faithful, you walk the boardwalks. There's a steaming uh, pools, and the water is extremely hot. And there's grasses growing in water. It's 160 degrees in temperature. So scientists wonder, well, how is that possible? That's scalding hot, uh, hot, hot water. They took the, the, the plants out, they put it into a petri dish, they grew up the plant, the grasses, in, in vitro propagation in the laboratory, and they found a fungus. It's a contaminant, they thought. They threw the contaminant away, they purified, so to speak, the, the plant cells, they do, grew just the grasses out, they planted the grasses in, uh, in, in, in sterilized soil, they grew the, the plants up, and they all died at 105 degrees. They said, that's weird. And so one mycologist, a lady, always seems to be a lady, <laughs> said, you know, that may have not been a contaminant. Let's look at that more carefully. And the, she discovered that it, it was an endophytic fun fungus called Curvularia. If you have notebooks, this is a real good one to write down. Curvularia, C-U-R-V-U-L-A-R-I-A. Curvularia is an endophytic fungus that grows in the stems, in the stems and in the leaves of hundreds of species of plants. And the curvularia, when they uh, join back this fungus back into the grass, and then they grew the grass up in the laboratory, all the grass survived to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So it gave thermal tolerance, drought resistance, heat tolerance to the plant. Okay, so we fast forward to two years ago. Now they took that fungus and they put it into a culture library in the American Type Culture Collection in, in the United States. is a big culture repository where they keep frozen cell lines and liquid nitrogen. It's like a library that's kept frozen. And so they ordered the same culture of curvularia, and they wanted to work with tomato plants, because it turns out the curvularia is in tomato plants. And they got the curvularia culture, which is the culture from Yellowstone that had thermal tolerance, demonstrated by many other scientists. They joined it with the tomato plants, they grew up all the tomato plants, they all died at 105 degrees. Now fortunately, at the original laboratory, they still had that culture up on a, on a shelf that they never put into cold storage. This is very counterintuitive. Because you think you freeze things or put them in big, deep, deep storage, you preserve them. So when they looked at that culture, compared to that same culture that was put into the deep freeze, they found something remarkable. The culture of the fungus had a virus. And we now know that the combination of the virus, the fungus, and the plants growing together gave thermal tolerance. <coughs> it's one of the first beneficial viruses that have been discovered. And I give talks to a lot of doctors, I'd like to open my talks, how many doctors here can name a beneficial virus? The, the, the viruses are more plentiful and diverse than any other microorganism, microbe, in the, in, in, on this planet. And yet we, know, we only know what viruses there are through the pathogenic symptoms they create. So viruses can be very beneficial. And so think about the viruses and plants and fungi all working together as a consortium. Okay, so here we go. So, and these hemlock trees are going in the old growth forest. This is my wife Dusty, and beautiful Douglas fir and, 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 and hemlocks here. But these hemlock trees are growing on rotting logs. They're called nurse logs. And it's an indicator of an old growth forest environment. Scientists wanted to know how is it possible that these hemlock trees could photosynthesize. So when they took these hemlock trees and they put them into a greenhouse setting with the same amount of light, all the trees died. So how are the trees getting their nutrition? Arna Brandt and Samard, uh, two scientists, 1995-1998, they radioactively tagged carbon and nitrogen, and they found something astonishing, that uh, alder trees and aspen trees and cottonwood trees will, via the mycelial networks, transfer nutrients to developing conifer trees over hundreds of feet. Up to 14% of the sugars that these trees need are coming from alder trees hundreds of feet away by the mycelial networks. That was an epiphany to scientists because the scientists realized that the mycelium has a mothering influence, budgeting nutrients to guarantee the plurality and biodiversity of the plant communities. And so these fungi are now not looked upon as being temporal custodians, but long-term parents trying to guarantee that the diversity of the ecosystem remains intact. 
So an excellent book by Smith and Reed. This is the obviously the roots, but all of this is mycelium. The mycelium mycorrhizal fungi uh, uh, bring in nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, two limiting compounds, obviously, to plant growth. And the mycorrhizal fun, uh, the plants then secrete sugars that give that are point specific. So when you see these little nodes here of, of attachments, this is an active transport system where the plant is getting phosphorus and nitrogen and, and benefit the plants giving the fungus sugars and so the mycelium grows out very, very rapidly. An example of two trees planted on the same day without mycorrhizal fungi, with mycorrhizal fungi, two maple trees. Um, and so when you go into the forest, I like to tell people, when you see a setting like this, if you remove all the cellulose, all the lignin, all the carbon, you know, that's, that's plant-based, from this vista, what would you see? You'd see the exact same outline if there's only mycelium that was left. Mycelium is virtually everywhere. It won't be the same color, but it's exactly the same shape. So, this is uh, me standing on a, one of the, my giant logs. We'll come back to these trees that, uh, that fall because of these fungi, which I've paid a lot of attention to in my time. But let's come and talk about mycelium. This is a rhizomorph of mycelium. It's braided. It can hold more than 30,000 times its mass. So when the mycelium goes through a habitat, it grips the habitat. And walking in the woods around here, several times there was this bounce factor. And, and as we're walking through the woods, I feel this bouncing underneath my feet. And I, I just know it's just rich in mycelium. So the mycelium holds substrates together and prevents erosion. And as bizarre as the field of mycology can get, here's the first underwater mushroom. The first mushroom discovered that grows underwater, called Sathrella aquatica. Three friends of mine, Robert Coffin, Jonathan Frank, and Darwin Southward. Robert Coffin was a hydrologist in, the, in southern Oregon, walking the Rogue River. And he was walking and measuring uh, water flow, and looking at, 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 the, at the trout and salmon uh, health. And he looked down and he saw these mushrooms growing underneath, you know, underneath the water, in the gravel. And the water is flowing fast. This is a fast moving stream. He couldn't believe his eyes. He found three or four more, got excited, he picked them, he took them back to the local university, made some phone calls, and he, if he had called me, I would have said the same thing the other mycologists said. You probably found a mushroom that fell into the water, it was on a stick, and you know, you found a mushroom that was going in the water. Okay. But he goes, no, no, you don't understand. So he was actually quite depressed. He went back, and, and they did his work, and he came back the next year, he found hundreds more. He goes, okay, i got to bring these scientists up here to let them see this. So he brought other scientists up, and sure enough, this is the first underwater mushroom that's been discovered. And bubbles form, the spores are in the bubbles, and the bubbles goes downstream, and they pop. So what is the role of this mushroom within the ecosystem? You know, we don't know. But we were able to get this in culture, and it's a good thing we did, because because of logging, now siltation now has, has clogged that ecosystem, and that mushroom is on the brink of not being able to be discovered again. So this is sort of my life. <laughs> I throw enormous amounts of mycelium uh, in culture, and, uh, and I save strains from near extinction. So I specialize in strains where habitats are in jeopardy. And I go into those habitats, habitats and try to stay, uh, save the, the, the fungal strains that are resident. Here's a mushroom that grows in the dark. It's called Mycena chlorophyst. This is an undoctored, not photoshopped. This is exactly you know, what the, the image looked like. It was with Kodachrome uh, 400 print film. And it's a luminescent mushroom. And the mycelium luminesces at night and attracts insects. And so the, it, this is a really complicated science because you're trying to find out what species that luminescent mushrooms attract with insect populations. As many of you know, lots of insects are very active at night, less predators around, and, but they're, they're attracted to fluorescing mycelium. And then by picking up the mycelium is one way of, of the bugs spreading the spores in the mycelium to new habitats. So we grow lots of oyster mushrooms. We grow it on straw, day 21, day 23, day 25. And the mushrooms have a very strong immune system up until sporulation. The mushrooms prevent bacteria from growing on them. They have a host defensive resistance. They produce natural antibiotics. But upon sporulation, the spores go out and then the mushrooms give themselves up. They open themselves up to bacterial contamination, quote unquote. We call it that. But in fact, they set the stage for bacterial communities. And I propose to you that the, the these generations of bacterial communities growing on rotting mushrooms are actually critical for the plants that are growing, that are benefiting from these mushrooms, and as the plants grow, they get larger, and they create the twigs, the leaves, and the debris fields 
that then fall onto the forest that feed the mushroom mycelium. So these are directional ecosystems. The ecosystems are directed by the, the, the rotting mushrooms that are within them. So here is a Russian species. We found way too many of these uh, in the past few days. And this is past its prime, it's rotting. But as it rots, its spores begin to germinate. Now, lots of other things are growing on here as well. But the mycelium then grows, and then the mycelium goes under, underground. And a single cubic inch of soil can have more than eight miles of mycelium. I estimate that my foot covers around 300 miles of mycelium. That's how pervasive and infused these habitats are. And any of you can go outside and just tip over any log and you'll see these vast networks of mycelium that are literally growing underfoot. And I propose to you that these membranes are sentient. They're aware that you are there. They react to catastrophia and as you walk across these mycelial landscapes and membranes that are virtually under every footstep, the mycelium senses that you are there and responds in kind. So I spent many years in front of the scanning electron microscope. This is one of my electron micrographs. The mycelium is beautifully articulated. And indeed, it's a filtration medium. It's a biofilter. And so there's a flow of nutrients that get captured into this wonderfully articulated mycelial network. And so it becomes like a physical filter. Uh, but also when water flows, these swell with cavities and become little bladders. And as they swell with water, then the antibiotic properties of the fungi select the bacterial communities that grow in these little micro cavities. Again, setting the stage you know, for the bacterial communities, and these are the constructs of the food web. And then as the water is released, these little bladders, they release them one at a time. So myceliated habitats hold water together. You have a lot of sand in, in your habitat here. The more mycelium you can go in, into your soil, the more water retention that you'll have. And so the mycelial uh, membrane, and I looked at it, and it's, it's so fascinating to me because we have five or six skin cells that protect us from infection. The mycelium is only one cell wall thick, surrounded by hundreds of millions of bacteria per milliliter of water, and the mycelium can grow to thousands and thousands of acres. As these bladders then empty, and they become high humidity environments, a second stage of population of organisms begin to grow, all controlled by these mycelial networks. And so, when you look at these mycelial networks, they have something unique, in that they're extremely well cross-networked. And computer engineers have approached mycologists now for the past several years in designing computer and transportation systems, specifically based on biomimicry, or what I call mycomimicry, based on the mycelial networks. And what micromimicry is all about, and why these are so well articulated, is that if this branch here is broken, there's an alternative pathway for transferring nutrients. As a, and so, if there's breakage, it's cross-linked. Computer scientists will call this hot points, or the nodes of crossing. The more integrated the network is, the more resilient it is to catastrophia. If it's broken somewhere in the network, it's able to still function. And so, these are photomicrographic movies by my friend Patrick Hickey. And he's a mycologist uh, uh, at the, uh, in Edinburgh. And mycelium first conquers, and then it cross hatches. So first is territorial coverage, and then it begin, and then it begins the network. And this net, this microscopic movie by Patrick Hickey is absolutely phenomenal. We did not know prior to this time what the networks did, did this. These are comet nuclei, bundles of nuclei that are bursting. This is over about 40 minutes of time. These are transportation systems. And the nuclei shoot down the networks, they can cross, they can share information. The mycelium, the, the nuclei don't all go in one direction, actually some of them back channel. And so at the tips of the mycelium can be millions and millions of nuclei that are sorting out. So in this room, for instance, there could be hundreds of trillions of end branching of a mycelial network the size of the stage. And the mycelium only needs to find, if it encounters a new toxin, a new food source, a new insect, and cannot, has never seen it before, never encountered it before, the recombination of nuclei will, can come up with a new enzyme sequence, a new way of digesting that food source. If it is successful, that information then is back-channeled in through the entire network. So the network on the far side of the stage is now acquainted with the genetic memory of the enzyme necessary should it encounter the same food source. These things are self-learning, they're self-teaching, and they're extremely elegant in their design. So the mycelium produces enormous amounts of, of water droplets, and these water droplets are enzymes, acids, hormones, signaling compounds that we're trying to figure out, antibiotics, and all sorts of sugar-based complexes, especially glomulins. 
And the guanines in these sugar-rich complexes, the mycelium in advance of contact will secrete these and it will hydrate the, the habitat, make it wet. And then as the mycelium grows and into that now moistened habitat, it will actually reabsorb its polysaccharide sugars that prior to this point were shielded off and it reincorporates it directly back into this mycelial network. These are exquisitely designed to, to, to cover uh, uh, great ge geographies. An example of some of the, the jelly-like substances that the mycelium produces. And upon the mycelium rides many bacteria. And the bacteria sometimes can be parasitic to the mycelium. Oftentimes it's symbiotic. It's growing a, a, a symbiosis as a form of mutualism. And a friend of mine uh, uh, who works um, in, in a genetic laboratory in Southern California, uh, his name is Yuri uh, Gorby, when he saw my micrographs, he got really excited because we were both into networks. And he's a specialist on bacterial slimes. And these are rods of bacteria, and you've all seen slimes in the ditches and whatnot. And that biofilm that you're seeing, those bacterial slimes, are basically bacteria held together with these filaments. And so what Yuri did, which was so fascinating, and the mycelium harbors those bacteria. And so we're looking now at the unification of bacterial and fungal networks, infusing through and upon each other, and how this consequentially affects downstream ecosystems. <coughs> so I could not help but look at these mycelial networks and realize they resemble neurons, they resemble the organization of dark matter. Most of you have heard that 95% of the matter in the universe cannot be seen, but it conforms to string theory, and this is, a, this is millions of light years across, and dark matter also conforms to the same mycelial archetype. And the organization of dark matter, and this is a, from the Scientific American, is 170,000 galaxies in this deep field, microscope, uh, deep field telescopic uh, image from the Hubble telescope. And the dark matter uh, unifies these galaxies together. So I see this as the mycelium as, as a universal archetype. And the archetype is shared both by mycelians, both by our neurons, uh, both uh, by the computer uh, internet uh, and by dark matter. And I believe the invention of the computer in internet is an inevitable consequence of their previously proven evolutionary successful model. Networks survive, <coughs> networks are resilient, Net networks learn, and I think we are here, here today because of them. So the computer internet is the, the diagrammatic representation from the OP project. It also conforms to this, the same type of network theory. So let's go back in time. So the Earth formed 4.5 billion years ago, coalesced out of stardust, and then about 3.5 billion years ago, the first organisms were beginning to emerge in the oceans. The first organisms that came to land were fungi. They came to land about 1.3 billion years ago, and plants followed several hundred million years later. Fungi were able to come to land because they produced very interesting acids. And it goes to what's called the mineralization of rocks. You've all seen lichens. And lichens are fungi and algae joined, joined together, they grow on rocks. Well, the fungi produce oxalic acids and they pull minerals out of rocks. Iron, calcium, manganese. And these are actually calcium oxalate crystals that the mycelium actually pulls out of the rock, pockmarks the rock. And then the rock now has little micro cavities that water sits in. And the rocks become less, uh, have less tensile strength, they begin to break apart, and the first steps of rocks becoming soil. And so oxalic acid is two carbon dioxide molecules joined together. And, 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 and oxalic acid then grabs calcium, combines with oxygen, becomes calcium oxalate. And so these fungi's ability to mineralize rocks, they actually munch and degrade and consume rocks, which is really mind-blowing that a fungus would eat a rock, but now we know this is also true. And so when I find rocks, and I tip them over, and I find this mycelium in networks, I thought, first of all, oh, they're just cool, and there's water there, and much of mycelium is happy. And then I started looking a lot more closely, and I started finding rocks like this. And when you have the mycelium actually reaching up on the sides of the rocks, and on the bottom side of this rock fell down the big cliff, so I couldn't go chasing down. But it left this mycelial footprint here. But mycelium munches rocks in the first stage of soil generation. So 420 million years ago, this organism lived. It's been called by scientists Prototaxites. 
Uh, Prototaxites, 420 million years ago, there was no vascular plants. Uh, there, was the, there were ferns, but there were no trees. And the t this was the tallest organism on land, laying down about a meter high, about three feet high. Laying down was the tallest organism on land. Now, they found Prototaxites in, in, in five different continents. Um, 420 million years ago, the continents were all uh, joined together um, at the time of Pangaea. And the scientists at, at Chicago, uh, University of Chicago, um, uh, analyzed Prototaxites, which was first described, discovered in 1859. They thought it was a giant tree. They didn't know what it was. But through molecular analysis, they determined that Prototaxites indeed was a giant fungus. 420 million years ago, before there were, there were, were animals, you know, uh, there were some insects, but not flying insects. 420 million years ago, dotting across the face of the earth were giant mushrooms. 30 feet tall. Who knew? <laughs> and so these fungi dominated the landscapes. Obviously, they'd be attracting lightning, because there was a lot, a lot more uh, electromagnetic radi radiation back then. You can speculate as to what, what that means. But Prototaxides now is known as a, a giant fungus that occurred 420 million years ago at, at the time of Pangaea. So it's been found in Quebec, it's been found in Israel and, and Northern Africa. Well, they were not too far apart back then, not were they? Um, and many of us, I'm sure, when we were, I, I myself, I know, and many of us here in the, in the, in the audience, and we were younger, and, and we looked at the you know, images of Earth, a lot of us thought, well, it's like a puzzle, can't you just put it together? And the teachers said, no, no, that, that, that didn't happen, you know. <laughs> it's really funny that, that that's the prevailing theory now, is because of continental drift, you know. Uh, they did come apart. So, four and, uh, the, the 250 million years ago, at the time of Pangea, then the continents began, began to separate, and to Guantanamo land. And the continents separated apart, and of course that split the species apart, causes speciation, differentiation, you know, species that then began to proliferate, etc. But we go to 250 million years ago, and we had a, a great cataclysmic event. Now, at the border of the Permian and Triassic period, 250 million years ago, this very interesting phenomenon. In the fossil record, 250 million years ago, prior to this catastrophic event, the ratio of pollen to fungal spores was 10 to 1. Directly after this cataclysmic event, the PT boundary, fungal spores were 100% for thousands of years. There was no pollen. And so now, they just recently discovered that this fungus that, that gobbled up the forest was, is uh, called Reduvio sporonite, uh, 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 Reduvio sporonites. And uh, great name, but the fungus is extinct now, but they found this fungus everywhere. Three prevailing theories are that the extinction event where over 95% of the species on the planet became extinct was due to a methane hydrate outburst. We heard about that from BP just recently. Uh, volcanic eruptions in Eurasia, or an asteroid hit the Earth. I don't see these as mutually exclusive. The asteroid could have hit the Earth, triggered the methane hydrate outburst, and volcanic er er eruptions could have occurred all, all at the same time. <coughs> so, then we, and so, 65 million years ago, we have another, and we have another catastrophic event. And as you most of you know, the dinosaurs went extinct, uh, extinct. And another, and this time we know an asteroid impact happened here. Same thing happened. Enormous amounts of debris jettisoned into the sky. The sky was choked with dust. Sunlight was cut off. And fungi inherited the earth. The plant communities died. And those organisms that paired with fungi, because the fungi did not require light in order for them to grow, benefited through mutualism, through symbiosis. And so the lesson here is, as we go through extinction events, and now we've entered 6X, the sixth greatest extinction event known in the history of life on this planet, this extinction event is a thousand times worse from a species loss point of view than any other prior extinction event. We have more species now, but we're losing now species faster than we can find them. So the lesson has been, you pair with fungi, you, you survive extinction events. So this is where I live, in Washington State, the southern Puget Sound. This is the Columbia River. This is Canada up here, Vancouver Island. We'll go up here later on. And here's the Columbia River, and this is Oregon. And here is where the largest organism in the world, currently known, grows. And so I hired an airplane, a pilot, and I flew there. 
And this is a mycelial map that is 2,200 acres in size, 1,665 football fields, three feet a meter deep. It's the largest organism in the world, and it's one cell wall thick. How is that possible? It's possible because the mycelial networks are in constant biomolecular communication with the ecosystem. They're intelligent organisms. They have genetic memories. They have genetic histories. They hold and reserve these enzyme expressions at the ready to be able to use them. They set the stages for the bacterial communities that then become allies. And so these organisms are, are able to achieve these masses because of their very highly evolved evolutionary strategies. I actually had a hydro airplane twice. I went down there the first time. Couldn't find it. Um, and then we looked our, at the coordinates again. We knew we were there. We were, we were too low. So I went up in the airplane and we spiraled up in this really tiny airplane. We went up and up and up and up. And we're up about 17,000 feet. And in, in order to get this thing on my camera viewfinder, you know, and I told the pilot, and I said, I think I'm going to faint. And the pilot said, me too. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good sign. And so I said, let's go down. So we went from sea level to 17,000 feet. You know, had we done the you know, stage, of course, that would be different. So these mycelial mass also can form spirals. And I'm very much into spiral forms. And here is a spiral forming mycelial mat in, a, in, a, in Montana of the honey mushroom. And this is a, a new species that I get to publish. Um, and it, you can see that it spirals out as an accelerating way. So why wouldn't these mycelial mats, thousands of acres inside, form spirals? You know, it forms the basic, it conforms to the basic laws of physics. And we all know about tornadoes, hurricanes, and flushing your toilet. So the mushrooms are triggered into, uh, the mycelium is triggered into mushroom formation. There's hundreds of nuclei per cell. There's rhizomorphs feeding the, the mushrooms that are emerging. So powerful mushrooms that can break through asphalt. This is a shaggy mane mushroom that you can break in your hand, and yet so powerful it can pierce through asphalt. So what does the mycelium do? It takes plant material, or animal material, or primarily plant material, the mycelium, you know, transforms it. Lots of things happen. Ultimately, it feeds worms and soils being created. So fungi are the soil magicians in nature. They're, they're the boundary between life and death. They regenerate ecosystems. So here's our compost piles. Really happy at the garden today to see their compost piles. These are all shiitake, oyster, maitake, uh, uh, fruiting blocks that produce mushrooms. This is what these blocks look like about three months later. This is full of red worms. And so the worms are extremely mycophagous. They consume mycelium preferentially, and they transform the myceliated uh, wood into this super rich soil in a very, very short period of time. So this is an experiment that I did because uh, one test on bioremediation is that we call the worm toxicity test. And you throw worms into a toxic soil compared to a healthy soil, a hundred worms, and you see if they die, they live, and if they live, they, they reproduce. In toxic soils, of course, they all die. If you remediate the soil, then hopefully they'll live and reproduce. And so I went through the scientific literature, and I could find not a single reference, peer-reviewed or otherwise, even the popular literature, of the preferences of worms to my non-myceliated versus myceliated uh, wood. This is alder sawdust. This is alder sawdust plus mycelium. Same day, same moisture content, same preparation, everything's the same. We put 100 worms, we actually did this 700, we did 700 total, we did this experiment seven times, so extremely uh, uh, strongly significant, and we found absolutely remarkable, 43% of the worms streamed directly to the myceliated sub substrate, 5% went to sterilized solids. How is it possible at this stage in the evolution of science on this planet, there's not a single article describing the worm preferences for mycelium versus non-mycelium. How little do we know? And this brings me to a theme that I keep on coming back to, is that we make the biggest decisions at the beginning of the decision tree, and that we go down the wrong road. Because of the prejudice, the ego, whatever circumstance, it's important that we always question authority, we always listen to nature, but it just boggles the mind that we don't know the preferences of worms over mycelium versus non-mycelium substrates. Why this is important becomes extremely uh, significant in terms of habitat restoration and in terms of bioremediation. Worms finish the soils. A series of experiments that we did in, um, with Battelle Laboratories, whom I worked with for a number of years, this is a, a, a soil that's contaminated with diesel 
from a truck yard outside of Bellingham, Washington. And this uh, soil has been uh, had uh, diesel and oil spilled on it for 50 years. It's about it's about 22 percent um, uh, hydrocarbons, 20,000 parts per million. And so this experiment, and the Department of Transportation, a government agency, was told by the Department of Ecology, a government agency, that you have a toxic waste site, you have to clean it up, or your budget will be raided by the Department of Ecology, will take your money as a fine. So there's a lot of competition between the government agencies. But they gave an exemption for experimental methods. And so we were called, and we've been working on breaking down uh, diesel contaminated soils and oils for a number of years. And there's four piles. One pile is a control pile, one pile is inoculated with bacteria, one was treated with enzymes, and then we inoculated our pile with oyster, mushroom, mycelium. And so just to, people ask me, can you break down oil? Okay, what component in oil do you want me to break down? Can we have focus a little bit better? Up there? I just realized this. I thought it was my bad vision, but now we have the letters up on the screen. Oh, okay, well, so there's the, the, the majority of these are carcinogenic. And these are different uh, uh, molecular weights. And so the, the really heavy aromatic hydrocarbons take a lot longer to break down than the smaller ones. They're big ring structures, and you have to disassemble them. This is what these fungi do. The mycelium absorbs the oil. The mycelium actually becomes black. The mycelium is producing enzymes to break down lignin and cellulose. Well, cellulases and lignases, those are the enzymes that break it down. Well, the mycelium also breaks down oil, and we believe it's, it's, the, it's the sem, this, uh, tearing apart and breaking apart the hydrocarbons and remanufacturing them into fungal sugars, carbohydrates, polysaccharides. And so we came back to our pile eight, six, eight, eight weeks later. Our pile was covered with hundreds and hundreds of pounds of giant oyster mushrooms. The other piles were dead, dark, and stinky and lifeless. Our pile was now light in color, which is indicative of the fact that it, it broke down the hydrocarbons. We went from 20,000 parts per million to less than 200 in about 16 weeks of time. The other piles, the control pile, the pile with bacteria, and the pile with enzymes, still remained at 20,000 parts per million. Now, we had some really uh, fierce competition on this, and a lot of people had put a lot of money into the other experiments. So they were, they were quite, quite upset that we had such a great success. But something happened that was absolutely remarkable. Not only were the mushrooms huge, this is a testimonial. If you've ever picked oyster mushrooms, anybody out there, you know that these mushrooms are happy mushrooms. Huh? They have a, they're really, really big. Um, and the mushrooms sporulated, and when they sporulated, it attracted insects. Insects came in, laid eggs, eggs became larvae, and then Birds came in and they brought in seeds. And then the mushrooms rotted, and so we have bacterial uh, colonies breaking down the oil. Then we have plant communities, phytoremediation. So these are the gatekeepers, fungi are the gatekeepers. It creates a domino effect where the fungi came to land first, the fungi repair the ecosystem first, and then subsequently the bacterial communities follow, and then the plant communities follow. And the last photograph, I don't have it, but it's a total green burn of life. And then our pile is approved by the Department of Ecology as being fully remediated. We were able to remediate this pile in about 16 weeks when no other best method could do it within four or five years, comparatively. Now, we had other scientists screaming, and I was saying, you know, I, I like to build bridges, not burn them. We're actually engaging bacterial remediation. The mushrooms rot with bacteria. So they need a food source, the bacteria does. So and we're involved in phytoremediation because the plant communities are coming in. But if you put those bacteria and plant communities in at the beginning, they all die. And then the worms come in. And then we do the worm challenge and toxicity test, the worms all survive. Not only do they survive, but they reproduce at normal levels. So this was a huge sort of a, a milestone in microremediation and has really um, got people expired all over the world. And there's 10 or, or, or groups at least now that are involved in microremediation using these methods. So you can take the crankcase oil out of your car, and if you get an oyster mushroom kit from Ann, for instance, and then it stops producing, it produces three or four flushes, typically, because is what mushroom kits do, then there's not enough nutrition there for the oyster mushroom to grow anymore. So you can take the crankcase oil out of your car, pour it onto an expired oyster mushroom kit, and grow more oyster mushrooms. <laughs> Would not recommend you eat these. <laughs> we analyzed the mushrooms, and there's no hydrocarbons in them whatsoever. But because of the gears, there's heavy metal tailings that are in the oil. I think all of you know that. And so mushrooms do hyperaccumulate heavy metals. 
So you should not eat mushrooms along roadsides or in heavy metal contaminated environments. But the mushrooms, you know, uh, can use the oil directly as a food source. And so I started because the BP oil spill started, you know, going back to the beginning of the decision tree. And I started asking some very basic questions. Well, will mushroom mycelium float? Certainly it should. So I threw some moisture mushroom mycelium on straw into an oil slick that I created in a little tub and absorbed the oil. And then immediately, within a few days, I got this clear strip where the enzymes from the mushroom mycelium started breaking down the oil. And then it broke down, they like, absorbed a huge amount of oil, and then all these bacterial colonies uh, started forming. Now, I don't have a photograph from the past few days, but I've been told this water is almost totally clear. The enzymes being secreted by the mycelium have broken down the oil to a state where the bacteria then can finish the job. So, by microremediation leads to bacterial remediation. So, we started creating something very weird. Uh, and that is we started creating mycobooms. And these are hemp socks. This is encased in plastic initially. But it's a hemp tube, totally biodegradable, full of straw, unlocked with mycelium. So we floated and picked up, well, let's see if they float. And sure enough, they float. They're still floating today, about 12 weeks later. So the mycelium is floating. And I said, well, let's just watch this. And the mycelium outcasts fragrances that attract fungus gnats. And I think most of you know that mushrooms that attract flies. And the fungus gnats started laying eggs. And then I have all these fish and tadpoles that started eating uh, and surrounding the mycoboom just at sunset and at dawn. And so the mycobooms are becoming this oasis of life where all these organisms are being attracted to the mycelium because it's so fragrant. The oyster mycelium smells like licorice, like, like anise. It's a very, very strong and pleasant anise fragrance. So we said, well, this, what about the salt water? So we went out and put it out in salt water. And I, several mycologists said that oyster mushrooms would not be tolerant of salt water. I said, well, how do you know? Have you tried? They go, no, but everyone knows that salt water is bad for mushrooms. I go, oh, I don't, you know, well, have you tried? They said, no. So we tried. So we put these mycobooms out on salt water. And then we started spraying the, the, the mycobooms with salt water, and the mushrooms all developed perfectly fine. Oyster mushrooms are tolerant to salt water. Who knew? I mean, most mushrooms would be harmed by the salt water environments, 3% salt. And the oyster mushrooms are trying to be tolerant to salt water. So now we are designing these as to be we're, uh, into floating mycelial islands. And we're working with Daniel and John Todd and, and uh, Galen and others. And so the idea is to make these floating mycelial islands of microbooms that we be spiraling out. And we plant plant communities on, aquatic communities. And the mycelial enzymes then going into the environment, you know, will be breaking down the toxins, will be feeding the fish populations, the insects will be be attracted to it. So I think this again is a step in the, in the creation of an ecosystem through evolution uh, using mycelium at the beginning of the process. And the booms then fruit with mushrooms, which is always fun. They come out in this case at the ends. So I've been involved in several microremediation projects and this is one that I particularly like because in working with First Peoples uh, of the Makai Indian tribe in the, uh, Northwest Washington State, this is their sacred island. It's a 21 acre island. It's a burial site. But the U.S. government decided to take it over in the 1850s because it's strategically placed between the United States and British Columbia. And so this island here uh, became militarized to track ships, airplanes, later on World War I, World War II, particularly submarines. And so they militarized the island and they took it away by eminent domain, which in the United States that means they, the government can steal your land. And they took it away from the Indians and then they had it for 150 years. And then they told the Indians, you can have your island back. Well, the Indians aren't stupid. They said, you polluted our island. You destroyed our island. It's a burial site. You have to return it back to its natural form. So this is what the island looks like today. It's 21 acres, almost no trees on it. Um, and so the Department of the U.S. Department of Defense has to remediate this island. And they've tried three other remediation strategies, including trying to haul the soil. Because when they had diesel generators here, they had a big derrick bring up diesel to run this island, and that's what it looked like. It was a total campus. 250 people lived on this 21 acre island, and they had diesel generators to power. So they had all these antennas and radio towers, etc. I personally think they should have left it this way and given it back to the Indians as a campus, and they could have then done what they wanted to do with it, but instead the U.S. government decided to blow it up. You know, typical American response, you know, blow things up. <laughs> 
so they blew it up and gave it back to the Indians, and the Indians said their thanks. And so after some negotiation, the U.S. government now has to remediate this island. The cool thing about this is uh, we fly in the Department of Defense helicopters, government military helicopters. So we fly, fly over with the, with the Native Americans, and we land in this little heli pad here. Um, and Dusty, my wife and I are there, and you know, I'm looking for trees to make wood chips so I can grow mycelium on wood. And I'm looking around going, what am I going to use? You know, what can I possibly use to grow mycelium? I'm such an idiot sometimes. I'm looking and looking. I said, well, come in the spring. We'll collect mushrooms. Come in the fall. So same area. We'll come in the fall. And look at that. <laughs> Salmon berry canes. You know, canes. You know, of, of berries. And I go, oh my gosh, there's all these canes. They're renewable. You know, I can cut these. We can then grow the mycelium on it. We can produce the enzymes to break down the diesel saturated in the soil. So this is my daughter, Medina, who's getting her master's degree in environmental science and micro-remediation. Um, and so we went to, and then, okay, well, what mushroom species are unique to canes? Ah, we found one. Marasmianus candida. Um, and we looked at Marasmianus candida, and sure enough, it produces enzymes that break down hydrocarbons. So now we're amplifying the native strains unique to this island that have already adapted to the pollution in the ecosystem to be able to amplify them. So we take the canes, and now we're chopping them up, and I won't go through the whole process right now, but in the past two weeks we've had some fantastic results. We have six strains of mushrooms from this island. We have several strains, one in particular that's a superstar uh, that can break down the hydrocarbons. So we'll do two acres at a time, working with the Native, uh, the Native Americans, you know, and, and trying to remediate this island, breaking down the toxic waste. We found turkey tails on the island. Do you have that as well? And we found this agrosibi. This is one of our superstars. That's a terrestrial mushroom. Uh, that grows, that grows um, in the grass uh, underneath uh, the barricades. So this is what we like to do: is go into polluted environments, find what nature's already elected, you know, uh, cultivate those species, amplify them, put them back into the natural environment. You're guaranteed that it's, that it's adapted to the season. You're guaranteed that it's adapted to the toxins. It just makes a lot of sense. Nature bats last. The bases are loaded. <clears throat> when nature votes, we should listen. So that's what we do. So this is where Dusty and I live. We have 20 acres on Skookum Inlet, and here I'm in another airplane, <laughs> and I, the windshield looked up on the way, I couldn't take a photograph, so I went around three times and I told the pilot, I want you to you know, drop the wing when I tell you, and don't worry about what I'm going to do. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I paid you already, haven't I? So we went around, and, and it's still 100 miles an hour, 120 miles an hour, and I opened up the door of the airplane, and I had one of those slip friction seat belts that I didn't expect. And so when I opened up the door of the airplane, I still had my, my hand, one hand around the, 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 the seatbelt, my camera in the other hand, I literally fell out of the airplane. I mean, I, but I didn't want to drop my knife on camera, so I held on to the, the strap, and I fell out of the airplane. I had one foot still inside the, uh, inside the airplane. I'm dangling out. I thought, well, I'm here, aren't I? So I want to take some photographs. <laughs> I took three photographs, and I, with all my might, I pulled myself in, out of the airplane, in the, in the airplane. And, Pilot told me the first passenger has ever left my airplane without a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, I, uh, so we put wood chips. The reason why this little farm here at Cal's Chickens and Pigs, which I went about the farm, they more than double, and we moved on to this uh, uh, this inlet, Scoop Inlet, which is really rich in shellfish, oysters, and clams, and sam six salmon runs come through here, and uh, the amount of pollution coming from septic systems. Was, was shutting on the shellfish beds and threatening the salmon runs. And so directly after we moved there, the sheriff shows up. Like a week after I moved there, I thought that was fast. I didn't think I haven't done anything illegal yet. The sheriff already showed up, gave us a summons. Every landowner on this property, on this inlet, got a summons saying you get two years to replace your septic system with an approved septic system or we'll shut you down. So I couldn't afford a $25,000 septic system, but I could afford putting down wood chips. So I put down wood chips in the little gullies and I inoculated it with a garden giant mushroom, which grows really, really vigorously. It's the one that I highly recommend for finhorn. Now I will get you mycelium of it, and unless you already have some from this region, it's really important that you start growing this mushroom. It loves wood chips and soil complex habitats. And I put down the mycelium of this mushroom, and this mushroom computers is huge, huge. Uh, size fruit bodies. These are five pound specimens and uh, and the mycelium becomes a biofilter and so the another fleet of vehicles show up at my place a year later 
And I thought I was really in trouble now. <laughs> and they said, you're the only property owner that has an anomaly in our analysis. You didn't replace your septic system, correct? I said, yes. And you have more than the amount of cows, the chickens and pigs you had before. You can see that they more than doubled. And they said, they, it's unusual, you have a hundred-fold reduction. Well, more than a hundred-fold reduction of E. coli coming up for property. What did you do? So I took them out and showed them these beds of wood chips. And that was a dawning of microfiltration. Using sheet mulches, sheet mulches are six inches to 18 inches deep. We try to keep them aerobic, we don't want to go anaerobic. They have good pore and porosity, and we infuse them with mycelium in little swales, where the water travels the, last, the least of, uh, path of least resistance. So an excellent thing for remediation, for cleaning up your gray water, is using wood chip beds and not cleaning up the garden giant mushroom. But this is something that all of you can do, you know, starting tonight or tomorrow. And it's seemingly unfair, from my point of view, doing this for 35 years, that I can tell you in two minutes, the simplest way to cultivate mushrooms in the world is that you take a mushroom and it has these rhizomorphs at the base of the stem. Now, not true with a cat. So, this works also for your parasol mushrooms. The rhizomorphs at the base of the stem, you cut the mushroom here. We call this a stem bud. There's people, uh, bears, people, and deer. We don't, we eat mushrooms, you don't have bears here, but what do we all do? We leave the stem buds alone. We drop them as we walk, oftentimes. Well, if you're a mushroom species and you have an animal picking you up and discarding the stem bud, it's an evolutionary advantage that your stem bud regrows because now you've just been transported, you know, by an animal to a new ecosystem. So you take the stem buds, you take corrugated cardboard, you soak it, and you break up the stem bud into little sections a few inches apart, and you wrap it up in corrugated cardboard, put it outside in the blackberry patch or wherever in a little shaded area, wait about four weeks, and then you have mycelium running. The stem butts regenerate into mycelium. The caps won't do this, but the stem butts will. And so the stem butts, the stem butts have this, this chi, this, this key power that's within them that's phenomenal. Then it revegetates back into mycelium, and then you put wood chips on top of the cardboard, and the mycelium comes up in the wood chips. Why this is particularly important is this is immunized mycelium. This is mycelium that is in contact with microbes that already has an immune system that's familiar with the microbial environment into which they're placed. Whereas if you take a cultivated mushroom from a laboratory, it's the baby in the bubble syndrome. It's been grown in vitro, in absence of competition, in absence of contact with microbes. You throw it outside and organisms gobble it up. The acclimated mycelium, as we call it, it has tremendous force of growth potential. And so you grow this out, and then we inoculate burlap sacks, and the burlap sacks then run through the mycelium. Mycelium loves fabrics. There's a few universal truths here that I'm going to sort of tell you what I've discovered is it's same self-recognition. The mycelium is a fabric of cells. The mycelium likes fabrics on different orders of magnitude. So if you have burlap sack or fabrics that are biodegradable, mycelium runs. And the more you can run the mycelium, the faster, then the, the more mycelial momentum you have to eclipse barriers and to make things work. So you can take stem butts and downstream from a farm producing nitrogen and E. coli and all sorts of other nasty things, or from a power plant producing pesticides, hydrocarbons, etc. You can do burlap sacks and you can lead to habitat restoration. So Dustin and I were called specifically by the Mason County Conservation District, Soil Conservation District set up by FDR after the Great Depression and to help farmers and landowners preserve soil. And so one farmer was found out by this non-governmental agency that they were the source of E. coli pollution that shut down the shellfish industry that was losing Mason County, Washington, millions of dollars per week and lost revenue, lost wages, lost taxes, less money to buy food, etc., etc. So we went up valley from this farmer and we found a native oyster mushroom growing on a maple log. And before we did this, we sent out 10 species of mushrooms for analysis to a, to a Food and Drug Administration laboratory to see what, what mushroom strains were best against E. coli. And we said, well, let's try MRSA too, Staphylococcus aureus. We all know about MRSA, two bacteria. And we did 10 mushroom strains, and lo and behold, three strains here reduced the amount of bacteria for more than 100 million, this is the logarithmic scale, 10 to the 8th power, 100 million colonies in a milliliter of water, you know, that's 23 drops of water, 100 million.
billion colonies down to a hundred. A hundred million down to a hundred is, uh, is uh, you know, 99.99999% inhibition of bacteria. One of those was a pearl oyster mushroom, and one was a birch polypore. My hat is a birch polypore, and one is a garicon, which we'll come to. But so we went to the oyster mushroom because we could grow those. So we set up lines of burlap sacks downstream from this farm. This is the farmer that was in trouble, third generation farmer, you know, nice, nice guy, nice family. Didn't mean to, to get the neighbors, you know, to shut down the shellfish industry. Everything was kept on the down low, very quiet, because had the health department and the government found out this is a farm, they would have fined him, you know, severely. So we went in there, did this uh, installation of 360 burlap sacks for oyster mushroom mycelium, and this is an example of what happens. This is now this is a ditch. The water follows the path of least resistance. So the water actually is flowing through here about like this speed. So we put like 25 bags in the gullies, and then we line the swales that are not as steep with a lot more bags. And this is before microfiltration, and this is directly after. Now we did water samples up here, water samples down here. 900 to 30, 1600 to 240, 240 to 30. This one actually went up because we had a little back eddy, we found a little hot spot, so we had to make sure that our samplings were far enough away from the back eddies. But generally speaking, a 10 to 1 reduction of coliform bacteria with 25 bags of mycelium and burlap sacks using this method that I just described. So we have engineering plans now. There's 14 districts, soil conservation districts across the United States. We have, I think, several hundred of these sites uh, in now in play. We have 14 in Mason County. These are designed to be fish friendly, so the trouts, the Department of Fishery got involved in some of these ditches actually become trout habitats. And so we have installations now, uh, like I mentioned, in several places in Mason County. They are storm resistant with the staking method that we have. And these are our current sites in Mason County, all of which are outfalls and pollution uh, sites. Um, and this place here is Hoodsport, Washington. For five years, Hoodsport, Washington has been closed for recreational and commercial shellfish harvesting. And no other method, they call this management practice, the Department of Ecology, anybody else could do, could solve this problem. We put down 25 burlap sacks. Two weeks later, it was cleaned with E. coli and opened for shellfish harvesting for <coughs> recreational and commercial uh, people. So we found an end run approach that no other ecological engineer had discovered using amplifying native species that have gobbled up bacteria. This is all something that you can do you know, in this environment as well. The burlap sacks then produce mushrooms, well that's great because now you have more stem buds. So you can regenerate the mycelium here by using, using the stem buds. Or you can plant the, the, the burlap sacks with a little ecosystem of native grasses, in this case we put a Douglas fir tree in the center, and then you could put it over mineral earth. So if you want to take your sandy soil and you want to increase organic matter, one thing that I would advocate is you do what we did here, which was a solid bed of burlap sacks. In this case, we put uh, poplar trees. And then you inoculate it with mycelium. And then if you want to do the species succession of grasslands, the shrubs, the trees, you can do it that way. But you can design your ecosystem using these burlap sacks where the wood chips become soil. Ten inches of wood chips become one inch of soil in two years. And so that way you can build your organic mass by using burlap sacks.